Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 92, A Small Problem. Storing a large collection of tabletop game miniatures. From the Hammer, I'm Sean, and for live from Auto City, Canada, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, and in addition to our main topic of organizing, sorting, storing, and transporting miniatures, I'm going to resurrect a review of the Star Trek deck building game going back to uh, 2013, seven years ago. Uh, in our week of review, I've got a two-player game on Lanterns, more unlabeled, some more eminent domain. We finally combined Exotica and uh, Escalation together. Uh, and an online play of Clans of Caledonia with one of our awesome Patreon patrons. And our first look at Quad Heroes. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of online. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We adore your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, a comment from Roger B. on our topic of free games that can be played with basic dice. Here's one not free, but very cheap. Roll Estate from PNP Arcade. Only $3. Well, thanks, Roger. We actually had this one on our list of free games released by publishers to keep people busy during their pandemic. That's at master list we have at tabletopbellhop.com. It was free for all of June but it sadly isn't anymore. Now, based on the feedback I've heard though, it does sound like this is really well worth the $3. It's not just Roger that's saying it. Um, I was trying to get through some of my podcasts the other day and Crystal from on um, Board Game Blitz was also raving about just how good this game is and so worth it for $3. So I do strongly ch suggest checking that out. And I believe that would have been April, not June. But again, we're in quarantine. Oh, still, I don't know what's happening. We'll be like, sure. In the future, it's going to be free again. I don't know what the heck's wrong with me with the months of the... the whatever I talk about... The months of the week are games. tough. That's Yes, the months <laughs> of the week are killing me. We'll be sure to drop a link to Roll Estate in our notes. Now, speaking of that list of free games to play while stuck at home, Info Holico writes, thank, Hello, thank you for this list. I've translated it to Spanish and posted it on my website with some additions and modifications giving proper credits to your site, of course. Well, thanks for that info, info Holico. Uh, we'll drop a link to that in our notes in case we happen to have any Spanish listeners and viewers. Though I do have to admit, uh, I tried to go there earlier today and I was getting a 505 error. So I don't know if they're shut down or what's going on, but we'll throw it in the notes in case it's back up. Uh, I've actually had a number of errors on some major sites uh, today. So there seems to have been internet hiccups throughout the world today. Okay, so maybe that's the, the main problem that's going on right Next now. Next, a comment on our must-have gaming accessories article. Bill Hovatter writes, Not everyone is able to spring for a dedicated game table. My favorite game bling is a 3 foot by 4 foot neoprene game bat. It's like a huge mouse pad that rolls up between games and stores in a nylon carrying bag. The mat is great for picking up cards or other small components, and rolling dice on it is a pleasure. I call that my game mat a universal upgrade. It makes every game we play on it better. Well, thanks for the comment, Phil. I got to say, this is a rather good suggestion. I personally, I don't know what it is, something genetic, something about my fingers. I don't know what it is. I have a horrible time picking up cards on flat surfaces, and a mat can definitely help with that. They also help protect your table, which is great for, especially nowadays, with so many people getting melt, uh, metal and gemstone dice. And in general, they just make things easier to pick up and move. Now, I gotta admit, though, I don't use them. Though, unless a game has a specific neoprene mat for the game, like I have the, the deluxe one for um, Rising Sun from Kumon, or however they pronounce it, so cool mini or not, come on games, whatever they're calling themselves now. I've got that, so if I've got a mat for a game, I'll use it, but otherwise, what I prefer to use is Shelf Liner, because this gives you that same cushy texture, 
that makes things easier to pick up, but it's also tackier, which means that your boards and tiles aren't going to slide around at all. Plus, shelf liner is way cheaper than neoprene. Yeah, neoprene mats of that size are going to run you about six, fifty to seventy dollars, giving on uh, you know what you're looking for. But now that that's saying the neoprene mat will probably last you longer and take more damage than the shelf liner. But shelf True. liners are cheaper to re cheaper to replace. So you yeah, know. A shelf liner you can find at a dollar store. You got uh, you got to buy sixty packs of shelf liner <laughs> before you get to the price of that mat. Yeah. Now they do look cooler. I got to yeah. admit, like a neoprene mat with a star field on it for playing X wing on or whatever or battlefield, it's going to look a lot better than just my black little bumpy thing but you yeah. know what both work and you can get a lot of uh customized ones too uh yeah. we'll probably put it the show no uh, uh link in the notes but viking mats is one that does a whole bunch of custom sizes and designs for neoprene mats now next up tom stone left this comment in our article about good licensed games mm -hmm. great roundup horrified is fantastic it's one of the best bridging titles for co-op game beginners and expert experts can both enjoy it. I think it's to ex uh, it's to explain and quick to grasp. Easy to explain and quick to grasp. Features an engaging theme with decent quality components and has enough replay value that it's that even a beginner will notice. My SO and I ordered it in a giant pandemic survival bundle, and so far okay. it's their favorite. The only thing to mention is if you or your group can play with harder co-op titles with ease. You'll want to start your first game with three monsters. It's not quite as challenging as the book indicates. Once you find the right difficulty setting, it's almost flawless. This is the first game I've bought in ages that Walmart carries. It really is nice to see the bar being raised for mainstream titles. Well, thanks, Tom. Uh, as everyone listening should know by now, we have talked about uh, Horrified quite a bit on the show. I've done a full review. We are big fans, and we found the exact same thing. The difficulty is, like, I almost say, don't even try one monster. It's not even worth it. Two monsters is almost a joke, and holy cow, is four hard. And I'm sure you could even try even more than four. So, yeah, big thumbs up on that game. I'm curious about this Pandemic Survival Bundle, if that was something that was available at Walmart or what. I tried to Google it, and I didn't find anything on that. But it sounds pretty cool if you get a bunch of co-op games in a package together. I, I suspect that may be what they're calling the, the bunch of stuff they bought so that they can survive. Oh, that's uh, possible. <laughs> that's possible. Now, John Lumsden had this to say about our Tanto Quare review. Finally, a review of Tanto that is more than just, lol, look at this weeb game for perverts. Well, thanks, John. Uh, I definitely tried to focus on the actual gameplay uh, during that review. I did want to stick to it because actually it's really good. It's, it's a great evolution of Dominion, the whole being able to... Um, Chamber your maids is the term in the game really changes the gameplay in a good way. Now, for people who are interested in that game, uh, the reason I reviewed it, I, I don't even know how long ago now, it was a long time ago, was that they have a 10th anniversary Kickstarter was that was coming. Well, that's actually finally live. Uh, funded in less than half an hour. So big congratulations to Japanime Games on that success. Uh, we'll throw a link to that in the show notes. It should still be going by next week for people who are interested in Tonto Kore. I'll also throw a link to the review so you can see why I think it's such a great game. Now, finally, we've got a number of comments on an older two-player game recommendation article that Mo shared for Throwback Thursdays. Chuck Yeager writes, I hated Onitama, probably because the game goes on way too long if the other person plays not to lose instead of playing to win. Frank okay. Metzer, uh, Menzer, yes, that Frank Menzer, recommends Black Box. Take turns hiding and guessing. Keith J. Davies writes, Finally got Viceroy off my shelf of shame. Even for a first play, it did fairly well with two people. I think it'll change at higher player counts and get either really cutthroat or really cooperative at four players. And finally, Vincent Manning commented on Facebook to say, I find myself going to this site more and more. This is a good thing. Ha ha. Well, that's always good to start finish off with. Uh, it, it, of course, that's a good thing for us, too. The, the more the merrier. Please head over to our website. Now, going back through these comments quickly, Viceroy is one I've been curious about. I'm good to know it, good to know it works with two. I love the fact Frank Metzer. Frank Menzer is the man behind the D&D Red Box, the iconic Red Box that so many people started off into role-playing with it. And he's a grognard in all the good ways. And I got to say, having a grognard recommend a two-player game from 1977 just fits the mold perfectly. Like, it's just great. I, I was just, I was thrilled. I almost, I actually, like, 
I screenshotted it, but I didn't share it. I almost like I, I fanboyed a bit seeing that one. So I've got a copy of Black Box. Now it was my dad's. It was one of the games I brought back from my parents' house when we were emptying it out when my parents had to move out. And it's been sitting on one of my shelves of shame or one of the piles. And I think I had to bump it to the top. You know what? I'm, I'm, we're going to have to break that one out. And Deanna and I should try it and knock that one off quickly. Now that leaves us with Chuck and his hatred of Onitama, which just goes to prove that not every game is for everyone. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. We keep growing with the sport of fans like you, so now's the time to make sure you've checked out all of our formats. Board Game Geek, Pinterest, the website at tabletopbellhop.com, youtube.com slash tabletopbellhop, MeWe, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we're everywhere. We are. There are. If there's a site we're not on, point it out. I'll join. There's no reason I would. I'm on Mastodon. We're on uh, Dice Camp. We're on Pluspora, which is a server for Diaspora. We're on Slack. We're on Discord. We're we're everywhere. Everywhere you go, you can find us and ask us questions. Another way to find out what we're doing is to sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly newsletter in your inbox. Once a week, usually on Wednesdays, I send out an email that recaps all the content we put out in the last week. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, uh, actual plays, and other interesting gaming news. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right, next week is the last Wednesday of May. I don't have the date up, right? Be a little quick. The 27th. So the 27th of May, it's the last Wednesday of May, and that means it's time for us to do another live AMA right here on Twitch. This month, we have a new way you can send questions to us, voicemail through Skype. To do this, you just have to give a Skype call to Sean, S-E-A-N, at tabletopbellhop.com, all one word, and leave a message after the beep. And what we'll do is we'll play them live right during the AMA and we'll answer your questions right off there. So if you can't make it to the actual show, which we'd prefer you to come out, come out 9 p.m. next Wednesday. But if you can't make it, send in a voicemail. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. here on Twitch and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with some more chat and some other content that otherwise only our patrons get. Yeah, one of the things I'm going to be doing tonight is um, unpackaging. I, I don't want to say unboxing. I hate saying unboxing because you're probably not going to see what's in the box. But I've got some packages that showed up from a few different sources, uh, one of them right here in front of me. And I want to open these up and see what's inside. Now, I have a pretty good idea what's inside some of them. Others, I have no clue. And the last time we did this, I was completely surprised by what was in the box. So we're going to be doing a what's in the box. One of them if it's what I think it is, is a prototype. So I should actually be able to open that one up and show off the components. And uh, the hint in that case will just be Valeria. So if people want to stick around for the after show, you'll get to see what are in those boxes. And it'll be a good heads up for what you'll get to see me doing unboxing videos for in the coming weeks as well. All right, not too much going on in the chat room right now. We've got uh, a nice group of people uh, who've joined us tonight. Uh, Ryan's upset, it sounds like, that uh, we're going to be doing the Star Trek CCG. Possibly he has memories of that. Uh... No, no, he's talking about the CCG. I am doing the oh. deck building game, not the CCG. Not the, the CCG, CCG predates the deck building game by at least 10 years, I'm going to guess. Uh, the CCG came out when we were playing Magic. Deanna actually has a huge collection. Well, had. I don't even know if she still does. I don't think we sold those over to CG Realm, so I think we still have them. Decipher put out a, a rather good Star Trek game that was very mission-based and not very PvP. It was kind of you own, did your own thing, though there were ways to interfere with each other. And it was a really... What I liked the most is it was so different than Magic. It did not feel like Magic. There was no mana. There were no summon monsters. You did this thing where you built a timeline, and you moved your ship along the timeline to encounter things, and you tried to collect the right crew to go to the right planets to do the right mission. It was actually really good. Plus, I don't know, like, Deanna was addicted to it, and you, that was one of those games where I'd buy the cards for her and stuff, <laughs> and it was one of the, you know, get it, need it, need it, got it, got it, need it, need it, and you'd be like, oh, I got Bearded Riker, that's awesome, Bearded Riker is an awesome card. It was, it was a really solid game. But no, that's not the one we are reviewing tonight. Tonight, we are reviewing the Star Trek deck-building games, there are multiples, from Bandai. So that is a, a completely different, divergent right. game system. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get to the show.
We're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere is Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way to get us questions is to send them through the website. They don't get lost that way. They get saved and I get a notification and everything else. They're not going to vanish. But I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. And I do have to say, we've been hammering through our questions lately. We are getting a little low. Like, we're not going to run out anytime soon, but we would love some new questions, especially new topics. What's been happening a lot recently is we have people ask stuff that we've already answered before, which is cool. I don't expect everyone to go back through our backlog, but it hasn't been long enough to cover those topics again. So send your questions as long as they're not two-player games or kids' games, because at that point, we got lots of those. Anything else, feel free to send your questions. All right, well, today we've got a question from Roger Braslett, who writes to ask, what are your suggestions for sorting and storing our hundreds of minis? <laughs> our hundreds? You assume we all have hundreds of minis, and I think we kind of do. Many of us, at least, are into the board gaming hobby. So thanks for the question, Roger. Uh, this is an older one. It took me a bit to get to this one. Um... This, I got to say, hits pretty close to home. Despite the fact I have not been into a full hobby miniature war game where you collect armies since I think it was Warhammer 6th edition. And trust me, I don't even know what they're on now. Um, that was uh, back when Deanna and I lived in an apartment downtown Windsor. Uh, and we were trying to, I was collecting orcs, she was collecting elves. And we were playing with Sean and Tom and Jay Murren, and we each had our own army. And I think we played like three games because they had just relaunched the game and they had these rules for this island you could inhabit and take over. And you started with only 500 point armies and we were like, now nah, we're all going to dive into it. Well, anyway, it was a long time ago. That's when I actually like collected miniatures regularly. But like I, I still haven't played for years and I'm still getting an ungodly number of miniatures. Now, there's things like the Reaper Bones Kickstarter, which they keep doing these every year. I only got in on the first year, but man, it was a crazy amount of miniatures. Like, if you were at all interested in miniatures whatsoever, you got in on this. Like, the price was so ridiculously low for the number of miniatures you got. And it's all using this new funky plastic that you don't have to prime and everything else. Like, there was a reason they were able to produce these miniatures cheaper than anything else. But, like, I got two of the vampire boxes, it was called. Like, I don't even know. I think that's like a thousand miniatures right there with the two vampire boxes i it just like that it, it's just nuts I, and i just keep getting more minis from board games nowadays yeah so and anyone who's seen the shelves behind him knows that storage is an issue yeah. and that's not just the shelves behind him anyone who's yes. been in the house knows there there are shelves all throughout the house that have that same issue yeah i've got miniatures kind of everywhere because uh, Part of it is, it's not even just, like I said, I haven't bought a miniature game. Like, yes, I bought the, the, the Reaper thing, and I got one for Christmas. That's why I have two. But even that was still, like, five years ago. I don't even know when the first Reaper was. Whatever, that was still a while ago. One of the things, though, is nowadays, it seems like every board game comes with miniatures. Like, in the last ten years or so, all our board games, all our games uh, are coming with minis. It used to be cubes, and then there were meeples, and that was good enough, right? You were like, hey, there's my army. There are a bunch of red cubes, and here's my character. It's a meeple. Nowadays, it seems like the market wants to have miniatures. Well, with the reduction in prices of getting plastic minis to market, uh, the growth yeah. of the 3D printing revolution, which has enabled almost anyone to make their own minis, it's put a lot of pressure on manufacturers to provide something that someone at home can do themselves. Yeah. That's true. And I think another part of it is Kickstarter. It just seems like the upgrade your standees to miniatures, upgrade your cubes to miniatures was a big thing. And it worked. And then you look at the success of all the, the come on games that just made millions of dollars for games, mainly because of their miniatures. I think just everyone started to jump on that bandwagon. Now, as for a ton of miniatures being in your games, replacing wooden cubes, the, this can be divisive. Uh, I, as for it being a good or a bad thing, I think it's up to you and your group to decide. I have mixed feelings myself. Like, I do love a good, well-made, detailed miniature, especially if it's a character or, like, a, a main bad guy or a, a boss or something like that, right? But other games, I don't mind the cubes. Like, I actually kind of like the abstract cubes. For example, any of the Academy Games board games, 
the the revolution series and the 1812 invasion of canada you just have a bunch of cubes on the board and it's got that abstract you're a general looking at a board kind of feel to me which doesn't bother me at all i actually like the cubes on the map now the later version vikings they put out switched all the miniatures and everyone i see complaining about is having to stand them up and they fall over all the time whereas just sliding cubes around is nice and easy but then again i don't think i would have reviewed and rated cthulhu death may die as well as I did if there were a bunch of standees in that game. Well, and especially not from a company called Cool Mini or Not. <laughs> True enough. Though it's odd, they do have games that don't have miniatures in them. I play like Cronia. I'm like, what? There's no minis in this game. It's from Come On Games, but no minis. I don't know. Like, like The one thing I got to say is definitely an improvement or, or an advantage of cubes, chits, meeples, cards, whatever you're using instead of miniatures is that they're easy to store. You just toss them in the box, like probably in a plastic bag or a plano or something, but you just put them with the game. You don't have to worry about your wooden cubes getting damaged. Maybe you're going to get upset that the, the, the paint might come off on your cubes for Terraforming Mars or something, but like who's ever broken a meeple? Like I guess some of the newer, more fancy ones, but like the standard meeple, those things are like invulnerable. I don't think you you'd have to like take a saw to one to damage yeah, it. Unless you've got certain pet types that might like to get their teeth on one, I suppose. But other than that, yeah. like it, it's almost an invulnerable little piece. I'm sure I could run one over with my car and the paint would scratch. Now this isn't true of miniatures, right? Miniatures need to be protected. Most of them have all kinds of bits and fragile pieces sticking out and bits and bobs, and. I, uh, they, they can easily be broken. Though so I do have to admit, the level of this problem does vary and because there are different types of miniatures because companies produce miniatures out of all kinds of different plastics and resins and, well, back in the day, even metals. Um, some are better designed to be handled carelessly. For example, the miniatures in Battle Lore or Memoir 44 are made of this flexible plastic that will bend instead of break. You can indeed just toss them back into the box. That's what I've done with my copies. But most of the miniatures, especially the ones from the hobby board games and from the war games, are going to need more protection than just tossing them in the box. Now, if you're lucky, the company thought ahead and the box will manage to organize all of the minis that came with mm -hmm. it. But usually that's with friction, which brings up the next group of people who have a problem. Yeah, because many... Uh, maybe, I don't know, I, some, maybe many. I don't know how many people actually do it. How, how many people paint their miniatures? I know a lot of people do. I'll just say a lot of people do. I don't know if the majority of board gamers paint their miniatures. It's, it's a minority, but enough people out there paint your miniatures. And when you do that, you are looking at a whole new level of protection being required to protect that miniature. You don't want your precious paint job ruined by your mini not being properly protected. Yeah, when you pop that mini into the plastic tray, that little bit of force you use is not what you want when you've just spent a night delicately shading that elven robe. Yeah, very true. Now, when you get into actual miniature war games, it's even worse because you don't have a box in most cases. Like, you, like, technically, they put out box sets for Warhammer, but no one keeps their miniatures in there, right? That's just the way to get it to you. And then even if the miniatures are sturdy and likely not to break, you got to find somewhere to put them. Now, this is the big problem I have nowadays. Uh, all the miniatures for Warhammer, uh, both 40K and Fantasy, I own my X-Wing miniatures, my Armada miniatures. Uh, I managed to buy an Army for War machine I haven't even played yet. Uh, I made a couple cars that I could use for Gaslands. I don't have a box to put those in. They don't, there's no Gaslands box, right? Like, there's no nothing. It didn't come in anything. I used a Hot Wheels car. Yeah, and it's not like even if you kept the box for, like, a 40K Army, that you could be using those because they were all full of flat sprues, not assembled minis in most cases. Yeah, exactly. So that leads us to talking about some ways to store and protect those miniatures. So the one I use the most, and I'm not saying this is the best, we're going to talk about advantages and disadvantages here for each of these, is put them on display. This is, this is what I do to store most of my tabletop gaming miniatures. Take them out of the box, assemble them if needed, maybe paint them, though it's been a long time since I've done that, and then put them on display somehow. I, in my game room, there have a nice wooden glass display case that's got a light at the top with a door on the front, and that's where I put my best painted miniatures. It also... Because it can seal shut. Well, it's not like hermetically shielded, but you can you can shut the door to keep most of the dust out. And then the rest of my minis are just on bookshelves. They just take up a shelf. I got a shelf for painted fantasy miniatures. I got a shelf for painted sci-fi miniatures. And I got a ton of shelves right in this room right here with unpainted miniatures. And now while these are great, you have to worry and do some sort of mental math with some space and dust trade-offs to make. 
There's only so much space you can dedicate to such things in your house. And when you start enclosing things to keep the dust out, that usually takes up more space or limits where you can put things. Yeah, it definitely does. And this does. It takes up a lot of space. So I'll start off with advantages. Advantages, uh, for one, they're on display, right? So people can see them. Uh, you can show them off. You're like, hey, look at all my cool minis. Another one is they're there. They're easy to get to. You want an orc, I can reach up here and grab an orc. Well, actually, the goblins are in front. Look, here you go. You carry got a goblin. It's nice and easy to do. You can get to your minis nice and easy. Ah, uh, people can see them. You're like, hey, there they are. But not only pe other people. I mean, it's not all about necessarily about flexing. You can see your own minis too. And yeah. especially if you do your own painting, you can be proud of the work you've done. And there's no reason you shouldn't be. Now, some disadvantages. Uh, the biggest one, they get dirty and dusty. And not only the fact they get dirty and dusty, but dusting miniatures is terrible. Like your, your best bet's an air spray can, which doesn't even always work. But like they get stuck in dusters, like, oh, it's it's a pain. And then you could just move all the minis and dust it. It's bad. Uh, they take up a ton of space, like Sean said. And you need to have the shelves, put them out, and they take up room on those shelves. Uh, especially if you've got doors and cabinets and stuff like that. Um, they're not with the games. So if I go to play Imperial Assault, I've got to then go to my painting case, open up my painting case, and get all the miniatures. And then even worse is what if I want to go play at the store? I now have to somehow transport those miniatures somewhere from where they're displayed to where they're going to get played. Yeah, and, and then transportation, I mean, aside from the dust problem, which is a real problem and increases when they're, when they're painted, a painted miniature is even harder to clean than a non-painted mini. Uh, yes. But transporting when you've got them on display becomes a massive problem. All right. The next one, the, this is what I do for most of my board games. I, I will admit it. And even some of the Warhammer games behind me still have them in there. It's just keep the minis in the box. They do this. That they came in not for the game that they're, they're for. I, I do this for almost everything. Um, many of the um, minis, from board games in particular, are usually a little stronger, right? They're not things I assembled. They don't have lots of offshoots and little bits that are going to break. So as long as they're not going to easily break, and I haven't painted them, I'll often just toss them in the box. And the not painting them is kind of kind of the real yeah. key here, as we were talking about earlier. You know, if you are going to take the time, or you are able to take the time, I know Ryan at our chat room isn't able to, but if you, if you do are able to and do take the time to really put in the effort to make that piece look better, you don't want to have it dot tossed around in there because it will look lousy really fast and ruin yeah, all that hard work. work. Now, the advantage of having it in the box is the, the biggest one is everything's right there, right? I grab the box, all the minis are, everything's there to play. I don't have to go anywhere else to get them. And plus, uh, because everything's right there, if I want to go play at the store, I just grab the game box and I go to the store and then I can play at the store. I want to go to Sean's house and play Imperial Assault. If everything was in the box, boom, here we go. Everything's in the box. Let's play. Disadvantage, obviously, chance of things getting broken. Uh, another one's running out of room. I couldn't put all of my Imperial Assault back in the Imperial Assault box because I have multiple expansion packs. And the expansion packs came in these plastic things that you can't put the miniatures back in. Like, once they're open, they're yeah. open. Uh, or And if you get um, the other one, too, is if you assemble the miniatures, they may be bigger. That often happens. Like Sean yeah. mentioned earlier, that if you get the, the packaging from, say, a Games Workshop box, it might be pretty thin to fit the sprues in. Once you got those minis assembled, they're not going to fit. And another problem is you may not be able to find the miniatures you want if you have a lot, if they're all just tossed in the box. So you might be able to, it might be hard to sort your minis. So if you have a ton of, I don't know, you put all your X-Wing ships in a big pile somewhere trying to find that one TIE fighter you need could be difficult. Or even worse, if you've got, you know, a 4,000 point Space Marine Army and you want to take a 500 point, you know, troop out to go do a little uh, skirmish battle. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> So here is what I more recommend, recommend more so if you are going to try to keep things in the box, is to, you're going to use the box that came in, but you are going to use a box insert. Now this is the step up from just putting the miniatures in the box. Now we've talked about box inserts quite a few times in the show, and I think people have learned by now that in general we're fans of box inserts. Um, when you get to games with miniatures, there are a number of companies putting out inserts specifically designed to protect miniatures and painted miniatures. 
The one that really sticks out in my head that I was really impressed by how they did it was the broken token insert for uh, Rising Sun from Command Games. This features an individual box for every army, every player, that holds the miniatures by the bases. So there is no chance of the miniatures touching each other or touching any part of paint on the miniatures. And then there's a separate box for all the monsters and the Kami figures and all the other odds and ends that you could get with the Kickstarter. Yeah. Uh, one of the problems I've seen a lot with a lot of box inserts, aside from the, uh, the, the grip problem and that which, if you want to paint them, is going to be an issue, uh, I remember putting away the minis in uh, uh, Legacy of Lopin. Uh, yep. And Big Trouble in Little Big China. Trouble yeah. in Little China. And the miniatures are similar, but yes. not identical. And they've all got their own spot, which means you need to have the little chart that tells you yes. where all the minis go. And it's just a cheesy little piece of paper and over the long term, you're probably going to lose and or damage it. Or if you've got it, someone else can't help put the minis away necessarily because if they can't mm -hmm. see the sheet, um, overly specific uh, you know, mini inserts can be a, almost yeah. as much of a pain as no mini insert in some ways. Yeah, to be honest, all the ones like I wasn't even thinking of those in this. I was thinking more of a custom box insert from a third party. Because, like, Rising Sun came with the, the trays to hold everything, but they're super thin plastic. Every time I take them in and out of the box, I figure they're going to break. And they definitely have that problem of they don't tell you where to put them. So if, for my monsters, I actually took a trick I found online using ball stickers and putting ball stickers of different colors on the base of the miniatures and then the same thing in the tray so you know where to put them. The problem is the ball stickers started to fall off, so that didn't work so well. But in theory, it was good. The other people have talked about painting them. But I was more thinking of these custom ones that kind of hold the miniatures so they're floating. Right. So they're not sliding in and out. Because like you mentioned earlier, one of the problems with a snug insert is you're going to have that rub factor. And that rub factor is terrible. And that's going to come up multiple times in this list. And you want to avoid that. Yeah. So for custom insert, like I said, I'm, again, I'm thinking mainly the, the wooden ones. Um, I've seen foam ones as well. Something specifically designed for that game is they tend to be a great way to protect your minis a great way to transport your minis and it keeps the minis with the game still. The problem is the price. Like some of these cost more than the games themselves. And I'm not joking. You can find box inserts that cost more than the games. Then you have to build them. And having now built a handful of these, this is kind of its own hobby that takes a certain amount of skill set and you're either going to love it or hate it. Uh, once you got everything in your nice insert, you're not going to show off your minis. You can't be like, Hey, look at this cool thing. Uh, the box inserts can make the games heavier. I, that may or may not be a problem with you, but especially if you're going to be bringing it back and forth from the game store, that could stink. And they can be completely made useless, obsolete, as soon as they put out one new thing. So I'm like, yep, my awesome cool mini box holds all the minis. Oh, they released one new monster. Well, that doesn't fit in my box. What do I do? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I'd be interested to see how, uh, going back to Cthulhu Death May Die, um, it was a really heavily packed box and we had the retail version not the version with all mm. the other things that came from the kickstarter box is there a whole other box like is there was there a secondary box um, for for the kickstarter version with separate boxes so the best way to see that is watch our unboxing video that he did of mike murphy's copy of zombie beside invader it was uh, like that it okay. was all these little separate oh boxes yeah 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 different was... add-ons and it's the same thing with Rising Sun. I have my copy of Rising Sun downstairs. I think it's seven boxes. Oh. Now, the box insert is actually, they call it a crate, and it's all wood, and it fits everything. Right. And I don't remember if, like, some of those they make, and they fit in the original box. Some they don't. Like, they also, the one for Rising Sun is a standalone box that kind of looks like a treasure chest. Like, they, they, they do a good job. Right. But I think it's like $170. It's insane price. Yeah. But it's going to protect everything for that game perfectly. So... That yep. they can be good, they can be bad. And I am certain there is a Cthulhu Death May Die one. Oh, I'm sure. And there's Broken probably Token one that holds the three-foot tall yeah. Cthulhu. No, I, don't, I don't know if there's one that holds the three-foot tall Cthulhu. I that, that one's a little bigger than our list. That's not a mini anymore. Yeah, yeah. That's a, ma that's a, ma that's a that's major. A, I, I don't know. A, a, um, max mini or something. Yeah. All right, next is a generic miniature case. I'm, I'm saying generic just because I want to talk about something more specific later. This is your generic plastic hard shelled plastic case that snaps shut some of them even have like locks on them because these miniatures can be expensive and like st people stealing warhammer armies is a thing sadly enough 
Um, so these tend to lock shut, and inside you'll find foam trays with rectangular slots for putting your miniatures in. For those of you here live, you can see one right behind me. I own a number of these. Uh, the ones I own are from Reaper Miniatures, uh, mainly because I got some with the bones, and I really like them. They're really nice. They work pretty well. I like to use them for bringing D&D &D miniatures to game night at the local store. And I have one that all that's in it is all my X-Wing ships. Now, it's the ones I chose not to display. I said I like to display my miniatures. But for X-Wing, what I do is I put out one of each ship in my game room around the room so you can see them. But I have multiples of the ships, so I don't want I just put one out for people to see it. Um, so there are hard cases. Uh, thank you very much for the raid. And uh, a lot of people, when we think hard cases, Plano, I think, is probably the first thing a lot of people think of uh, for that sort of thing. Uh, whereas, you know, you get your you get your one of your standard Plano boxes and you can bring your own foam. I got Plano as a totally separate care category. Oh, okay. Here I'm talking about specific for miniatures that come with foam that's inside and it's layered foam that has slots to put miniatures in. All right. So that's what I mean by this one. This okay. is actually a miniature carrying case. Oh, okay. We'll get to Plano. That's on the list. <laughs> <laughs> so what these are good for is these are great for protecting your average miniature. Uh, they can fit a large number of miniatures in one case. Extremely portable. Really easy. They have handles. And they're great for transporting your miniatures if you don't play at home. The problem with them, though, is they're made for standard character size miniatures. So if you have larger miniatures, they generally won't fit. Um, the other thing is with the foam. Foam works pretty good. But if you have, like, spears or bits that are sticking out, they can get damaged because the miniatures do shift. There's nothing holding them in place. They just sit in a little protective little cube. Um, and I have had, because the miniatures bounce around as you're carrying it, paint rub off due to, to rubbing on it. And the same problem you're going to have with any case like this is they're not on display, so you can't show off your work. Yeah, and you really have to watch out for things like uh, you know, rapier uh, warriors or stuff. Yeah. Those the, 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 the really slender, uh, pointy, long things that stick out are uh, the your uh spears. yeah yeah spears uh the the, the strange Banner. implement on your on, on your one gloomhaven character jutting out from yes. <laughs> the, the sword uh, yeah yeah we'll call it a sword um <laughs> but you know those things jutting out what they can do is they can actually uh bring, because it's not closed cell foam it's open cell foam they can actually poke into that foam get caught and twist rattle around and snap or warp all right, up next is basically the same thing, but a step up, and that's a custom miniature case because most games are now popular enough that the gaming industry has gotten to a point where there are companies out there that will make cases, and if not cases, then just the foam inserts that you can put into a case you already own designed for specific miniatures and specific games. Now, I know these have been around for a while. What I saw them explode onto market was when X-Wing got popular because X-Wing came with pre-painted ships. That was one of the first games where people didn't just want to toss everything back in the box, even if they hadn't painted their miniatures. So what people started putting out were ships, where, or sorry, cases, where you literally had a foam cutout that was the exact size of the Millennium Falcon and only the Millennium Falcon would fit in there. And you'd have a spot for so many X-Wings and a spot for so many Y-Wings and a spot for what else came into the original series there was one other ship that came in the wave one and then there was an empire one with all the wave one ships right and a spot to store all of those now since then these have exploded like there's x-wing ones there are warhammer ones warhammer 40k in particular has switched from what i used to play to be a miniature skirmish based game into something with tanks and jets there's a company called battle foam that makes an insert for every tank that's ever been produced for Warhammer. So if you have a Lehman Rust tank or you've got a Land Raider, you can get a foam insert specifically to hold a Lehman Rust tank or a Land Raider. It's extremely impressive. I know War Machine is another game, the Privateer Press game. There are companies, I don't know if it's Battle Foam, but there are companies who put out specific foam inserts for specific miniatures just for that game. Yeah, Battle Foam, Battle Foam is pretty uh, in insane with uh, the collection of what they have. And yes. it's it's all very, you know, custom cut they have they have generic trays but they also have the the very specific, very specific. custom yeah. cut by game so you literally just go to there and, and shop by yeah. game so the advantages of course are all the advantages we already mentioned for a hard case in the first place and while it holds the miniatures snugly so they don't bounce around at all so excellent protection disadvantage of course these cost more than any generic foam uh the miniatures fit snugly so you have to watch out for that paint rub so make sure you're well varnished um one of the problems is these are only specific models, right? So if you have your army, you buy it, and then you decide to add another unit, and if it's not one that already fits in your foam, now you have to go to get another piece of foam or another case. And I got to say, these don't seem to exist for board games. 
I don't see Battle Foam doing a Rising Sun insert for the, for now at least. So maybe I'm missing it out. The companies I looked at, they seem to really focus on the full miniature war games. So Battle Foam does actually have a Rising Sun. Oh, there um, you go. So so I I, I would say battlefoam.com uh does have a huge list of games. Uh they even have foam inserts for cards against humanity. So there you go, because you got to protect those cards. Because <laughs> if Mo gets to them, he might ruin them. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so right, yeah, there is there is the foam is out there. I mean, they even have an electric football for those old rattling. Oh yeah, no, football those aren't old there. anymore. They've been re-released. Oh, yeah, that's re why. But uh, those yeah, came so, back out. so so all sorts of yeah. stuff. Uh, battle foams are or, yeah, battle foams are a fantastic yeah. uh, option. I'm sure it's only one. Sorry, that that. Not yeah, I was gonna to, say the uh, thing with battle foam is battle foam's known to be the best. And I don't, there are now copycats. Yeah. I will just say that. So price check yep. is, is, is my suggestion is, is there are other people doing similar things. A battle phone's been doing it for the longest or at least are the most well-known. Yep. So then there's the compromise between the last two is the customizable foam tray. Uh, these I've seen people call um, pluck or pre-cut foam. And what it is, you get the foam, and this is a little hard to decide, describe, but you get your foam, and it's like diced, It's but not all the way through. Oh, and should. then you can pull out cubes. You can pull out sections of it for your for your miniatures. And I think these are great. Um, <laughs> Pluck foam has little little square bits yes. where you just literally pull out the square bits and, and make, your, make your shape out of the foam. Exactly. That's Sean's got some right there. <laughs> now, the miniature stuff is usually cut to a smaller little cube, so the cubes aren't so big. Yeah. So you can actually really get close to the shape of your actual miniatures. Now, others, you can literally just get a sheet of foam you cut yourself to whatever shape you want. Um, personally, I wouldn't pay someone that's trying to sell me a miniature sheet of foam. I would just go buy a sheet of foam and cut it myself at home hardware. But there are companies out there doing it. Now, the advantages, of course, again, you're getting all the advantages of a hard case because you're going to store this in a hard case, can hold pretty much any miniature of any size and shape, but you're probably going to have to do it yourself, so it requires some skill. And once you've done it, you're stuck with it. So you're going to have the same disadvantages of a custom foam tray. What, what if you decide to trade in your Land Raider for a new Lehman Rust tank, and now you don't? it's not going to fit in the same spot? And the same problem with all these sealed cases, you don't get to show off your awesome miniatures. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the customizable foam trays are great, but that's, I, I would recommend moving more towards that if you have picked up an entire something, a set, like a, a full set. Okay, now I'm going to buy something and do something with that yeah. full set uh, rather than the sort of picking up bits and pieces because that's where, again, where you're going to get into trouble by, you know, oh, I got rid of this, I got this, and, and mm -hmm. this is something you want to store. Uh, but the yeah. nice thing is you have a lot of different options on how you can carry that with, the, you know, the foam. So there's a lot yeah. of different cases out there. Uh, I know in Canada, especially if you go to uh, Princess Auto, they have really cheap hard shell plastic cases mm -hmm. that come with pick and pl uh, pull foam. Now, they're the larger pick and pull foam like the one I was just showing. But uh, again, they're, you know, 30 bucks for large, you know, huge mm -hmm. size uh, cases. The other people have recommended, I didn't throw this on the list because personally I was thinking more protection, is I guess you can now get foam the perfect size for banker boxes. Mm -hmm. And people are doing that for storing their minis. Like, I personally, that seems like a bit like I'm putting my minis in storage. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not going to be using them to play because it's going to be really pain in the butt to get that bottom miniature off the third box that's on the third shelf in the back office. But that is definitely, you can, you can get foam for various different size cases. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, if you're whether you're going to Home Depot or your local hardware store, or also make sure you check your art supply stores because they yep. have a lot of foam options there for artists that would work just great for your minis. All right, getting away from the foam in the cases. Next up, this is something I, I, I see in the miniature gaming field a lot: are the dioramas or battle boards. This is really popular with Warhammer and War Machine, I've noticed, or Hordes. And I have seen a few people do it for board games, but not often. And what this is, is you've got your assembled painted army, team, whatever you've got for your game, and you basically build them a set. You build them a scene that holds all the miniatures. People often use magnets for this. This way the, mag the, the minis stay on them. Other people have ways to lock them in. Sometimes just a matter of the basis fit on the board. Now, the best of these 
combine just having a display board with a way to somehow close it and transport it. So I've seen all kinds of bo boards built inside of like, I, I don't know, I want to call it a briefcase, but like those wooden cases yep. so that you can open it up and it's got a, you know, back display and it looks awesome and you can fold it up and bring it to the game store. These look fantastic and be a great way to both display your painted miniatures as well as transport them. Absolutely. These can be fantastic. And, it, you know, it while it may not happen a lot of the time for board games, if you again, if you look at something like, uh, you know, um, Lopan and, you know, you've got those great you go great action games that are very thematic or Labyrinth is another one. It's a horrible yep. game, but they're beautiful miniatures. So if you want to display them, something like a diorama is a really great way to do yep. that. And if you can make it portable, then you've solved Even a couple better. of problems. Yeah, these, they look great, right? So they're a great way to show off your minis. They're going to be custom made for your specific miniatures, so you don't have to worry about them fitting or not. It's a good way to keep your miniatures separate from each other so they're not rubbing. And if made properly, can transport miniatures. The problem is you got to make a diorama, right? That can be a ton of work. Like making scenery, dioramas, and displays is a hobby all on its own. There are people who do that for a living who have never painted a miniature in their life. Some fantastic YouTube channels out there that I love watching where people just like recreate a stream and that's it. That's all they did. I'm like, well, what are you using it for? And they're like, no, it just made a stream. <laughs> I'm like... The disadvantage too, though, is, is the same thing we said before with the specific uh, army foam is it's made for that army. So if you modify your army, you may not be able to use your board. Now, if you're good, you're going to make sure you use the same type of bases or something, and then maybe you can swap out some minis. But it's kind of like, you got like Sean suggested the last time, you got to be done, right? You got to be like, I have my forts. Like, this is all I'm ever going to use. Then you can do it. Other problem is these can be large, especially if you've got a large army. When you get into especially the 40K or the fantasy battle armies, it's a lot of miniatures. These boards are huge. Like where you're going to display that in your home, is going to be a little difficult. Yeah, if you if you've got it, although you know if you've got enough to start buying full forty uh, k armies and time to paint them, maybe you've got the money to display them as well. So yeah. you know your mileage True may enough. vary. <laughs> All right, this is a really popular one nowadays. This is something I don't remember seeing back when I was into board gaming, and this is just a step down from your battle board. You're still using the board, but all you're using is a board. And you're magnetizing your mini to the board. Board's got nothing fancy on it. Now, this can be done with a metal board. I'm saying board, I think, cardboard or, or wood. But no, just a sheet of metal and putting magnet or by using wood and putting magnets on the minis and the board. Now, what's cool with this is people are putting out travel cases where you can slide these in. A really cheap way to do this is you get a metal muffin tin or a baking tray. You just get a metal, metal baking tray. You put magnets on the bases of your minis, you stick them on your baking tray, and now you have some way to move your miniatures around and somewhere to, to move them all at once. That's the, the super cheap version of this. And then if you get the right kind of case, you can slide the trays into them and move a whole bunch of trays at once. The weird part is I was having a real hard time finding those. Like, they're out there. I see people sharing pictures of what they're doing, but I was having a hard time finding actual cases that slide trays into them. And I think the, they're from the food industry for a lot of them. Yeah, they would be, although it wouldn't be too hard to do customized thing, uh, you know, with some, with some nice, a nice woodwork. I, you know, we, yeah. we I, I know a lot of uh, different uses I've seen for, for like shelving units where you just, instead of the shelf, you just have yeah, the, you have the your sliding tray, your the sliding tray. tray and, yeah, yeah. On them. and you just literally need to route out a, tr uh, a path on either side, yeah. have whatever height you need. So. So advantages, it's a good way to keep all of one type in mini in one place, right? You got all your Empire troops on one sliding thing and all your resistance troops on another, or whatever your, your different sets are. Uh, the boards can be put on display. You could like slide them out and show them off, right? And it keeps the minis apart from each other, which is the important part, right? The minis aren't going to touch each other or bang into anything, and they're not even going to rub against any foam. So you don't have to worry about those professional paint jobs or protrusions sticking out of your minis. But be careful, you're making sure you're using strong magnets and trust them. Uh, people who show these off online sure love to flip them upside down, and I'm sure there's some that took multiple takes because <laughs> the mini's falling off. Uh, magnets do wear out over time, so this may be a temporary measure. And I gotta say, it doesn't look that great. Like, it just, you got a bunch of minis sitting on a platter or a tray. It's, it the other, works, I guess. The other problem you've got is, again, if you've got small children or plan to have small children, magnets can be dangerous. Yeah. So... Just keep, keep, you know, be aware that if you've got, you know, your little, you know, jar of magnets somewhere that uh, one magnet into a child's uh, belly is, is something you can deal with. Two magnets into a child's intestines is deadly often. 
That is true. All right, back to what Sean was talking about earlier before you realized I was talking about specific miniature cases is your plano and tackle boxes. These can be fantastic for storing and transporting miniatures. You can get these in a number of different sizes. They can store all kinds of minis, whether you just need a handful for a skirmish game, or you can get a full tackle box to carry your entire X-Wing collection. The advantage here that I really like that a lot of the other options don't have is most planos or tackle boxes have clear lids, so you can see what's inside the box, which is a huge advantage over some of the earlier suggestions. They're generally very cost-effective. You can get them cheap enough. You can get plano alternatives at the dollar store. Uh, most of them are modular, so you can adjust the compartment size by adding walls or removing them to fit different size miniatures. They're great for transport. M many have handles, and if they don't, they usually stack together. And often, and this is a huge advantage for board games, they'll fit back in the box. So you put your miniatures in the plano, and then you put the plano in the board game box. So you get the advantage of having your miniatures in your box. There you go. The disadvantage, though, is that the miniatures are loose. So they're going to bounce around, and they're in plastic, not in foam. So you got to be careful with that one. And again, the usual, it's in a box. You can't show it off very well. But now that being said, uh, with a lot of plano boxes, again, because they are customizable size-wise, you can get yourself some thin foam and yep. use that to protect them and basically uh, make, uh, you know, expand the space with foam so that the miniature just fits in. So not only has it got foam up, it's up against foam, it's not going to be rattling around as much. Sure. If you are going to do this, try and get yourself a closed cell foam or use a foam core or something that where you're not going to have that problem where some, the small bits will get hooked mm -hmm. in the foam yeah, and get damaged. Very true. And this is another one. This is an older tip from when I was on Cool Mini or Not, the website, before they were a big game company, was your blister packs used to always come with that foam. If you save that foam, you can throw it into your various containers to kind of make things a little tighter. Yep. All right. Here is my life hack, my gaming hack of the podcast. Keep your egg crates. This is something I use when I was running D&D at the local store, when I just needed to bring a couple dozen miniatures with me, or if I just needed some characters, I use an egg crate. The individual cups keep the miniatures from banging into each other, and the soft cardboard is about as good as foam for protecting them from damages. I used to keep my painted Warhammer minis when I, when I had an army. They were all in egg crates. It was, the, yep. it was just the easiest way to go. And if you've got smaller numbers, you know, a, a 12 or an 18 folding top egg crate does great but if you've got a larger army you can get the flat egg crates and stack them and yeah. you can hold a lot of minis really cheaply yeah that's the biggest advantage right damn cheap you're probably spending nothing on this because you probably already have egg crates at home and if you don't i bet you can go to the local grocer and ask them for the flats yeah. and either get them cheap if not free and i guess it protects miniatures pretty well like at least it stops them from banging into each other um for the smaller ones, they're pretty easy to transport. They don't stack great, but if you're only going to bring a couple of them, you throw them into your milk crate or whatever. Now, they're not that robust. Uh, you're not going to want to bring your miniatures back and forth in the same egg crate for a month and every weekend. It's probably not going to last that long. But egg crates are cheap. You get another one. And it's not going to protect your minis as well as some of the more expensive options we already discussed. And it's okay for storing miniatures, but not great. Like if you're going to do layers of the, the small egg crate, you got to, what if I want the one in the bottom and a whole bunch of egg crates stacked on a shelf. They don't, I don't know, the egg crates just aren't nest. They don't nest, right? Like they don't stack well and together. The other big problem you can run into is size. These are for yeah. character minis. These are for your standard D&D &D size minis. You can't hold a tank. You can't hold, you know, a lot of the stranger sized uh, minis you're going to run into. Mm -hmm. So you are limited in what you can use this hack for. All right, uh, this is not necessarily a hack, but just something I fear has to go on the list, and that's plastic baggies, because I use them all the time. These are for miniatures you aren't worried about. Uh, this is what I use for all those pre-painted miniatures that are out on the market now, all the D&D &D miniatures, the Pathfinder miniatures, the Wardling miniatures, which are these awesome minis of kids with little animal companions, all those soft plastic pre-paints that are out there. The big advantage of using baggies is sorting. I have a lot of D&D miniatures. And what I do is I have my miniatures sorted by a bag of Dark Elves, and here's a bag of Goblins, and here's a bag of Dwarves. And when I need a specific type of creature, and I've labeled all these, actually, like you can tell because they're see-through, but I actually did the whole use the marker and labeled them all and went, oh, this is the bag of Fire Elementals. Okay, where's the Elemental I need? This, of course, dirt cheap is great for sorting. It keeps sets of minis together, so all my dwarves are in the same place. 
it's easy to transport. I just literally grab the bags and toss them. I, I move everything by milk crate. I grab the bag of dwarves I need for the next adventure, throw it in the milk crate with my dungeon tiles and my dice. That being said, there are some perhaps drawbacks that you might yes. see from this discussion. <laughs> Yeah, and it doesn't really protect the miniatures at all. Uh, they're pre-paints, though. They are made of flexible plastic, and i got to admit, I've yet to break a single one. I'm doing this. I've never broken a D&D miniature. If I scrape paint off, I've never noticed, because, to be honest, they're not painted all that well in the first place. Um, it doesn't show off the minis, but in a way, like, who cares, because they're D&D minis. They're pre-paints. Uh, the problem, though, can have is if you have a lot of them, sorting can stink. Like, if I'm looking for the—I know I have the paladin with the shield and a torch, and I want that one mini— well, I store all mine in a big wooden chest, and trying to find that one paladin in that chest, even with labeled bags, is kind of a pain in the butt. Yeah, it all depends on how organized you want to be and how specific you want to get on labeling things. And, you know, are, are all your paladins in one place, or are all your heroes in one place, or, uh, you know, oh, wait, yeah. the paladin, that was an armored character, so he's in the bag with mm -hmm. the, the or, or wait, no, because he was in the party with the other person, so no, he's in the bag from the Thursday Night Adventures. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Definitely. I've, I've been through all of those problems. Yep. <laughs> all right. One final tongue-in-cheek suggestion for storing and protecting miniatures is don't open them. Keep them in the original box. This goes for all those miniatures. I know you've done this. That you have bought for games that you never actually play. Um, all those half-completed armies, those awesome miniatures you had to have but never actually got to the table or used. At one time, I opened and prepped and assembled every miniature I ever got. If I got a box of Warhammer Orcs, I cracked that thing open, I snipped them, I cleaned them, and I assembled them. And I was going to paint them, and I was going to build an army, and I was going to play. Well, I never got there. Now, I admit, I had fun building them, but I you can't see it from here, but there is a lot of assembled miniatures to my right over here. Um, nowadays, I, just, I don't even open them. Like, I get excited and I go buy the mini because I still do it now and then. I can't help it. It's uh, They call it figmentia. I've heard it called before. I've had that problem. Now I sit there and I go, you know what? I'm going to put this on my shelf. And then when I set up a game of War Machine, I will then open up the War Machine miniatures and assemble them so I can bring them to the store on Saturday to play. And if I don't get to that point where I've scheduled the game to play, they sit in the box. And I literally have that. All of my War Machine right there, you can see my starter set for Menoth, is still in the box. And they're going to sit there until I actually plan to sit down with, you know, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton. And he's going to actually teach me to play War Machine because I've been wanting to do that for three years. But until that happens, they sit in the box. So it's probably your easiest option, that's for sure. Yep, it definitely is. There's no work required. And you know what? The miniatures are going to be as good a shape as the manufacturer sent them to me. They're just as good as they were on the store shelf. Absolutely. Of course. Of course, I can't actually sit down and play War Machine tonight because all my miniatures are still in a box and not assembled. And while it kind of sadly shows how much money you spend on miniatures that just sit on your shelves for a long time. Also, definitely not a display option, although the box can be pretty. That's true. I can at least go look at all the stuff I bought that I don't use. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, I have got one final thing I want to talk about today. Um, this is going to expand on the topic, and that is terrain and scenery. So tonight's topic comes on behalf of our Patreon patrons. Uh, those of you awesome people at the hotel guest or higher level who entered a poll on our Patreon and picked our topic tonight. Now, on the poll, one specific patron, Jeff Seuss, commented to know, I'll pick this topic, but only if you also talk about terrain. So fair enough. We'll also talk about terrain. I don't know if this will end up in the article version of this, but at least for the podcast. So this is for you, Jeff. So the problem with terrain is in general, it's big. And added to that, it's usually and often very fragile. And a lot of it is handmade. So there's a lot more work and effort that goes into it. So you're probably going to require a higher level of protection. So you're going to want, you're going to care more about it. Than that miniature you slap some paint on? I don't know. Like, like I don't know. There's something yeah. more involved in building scenery. Well, and also compared to that, it hasn't even come with something to start. You start off with. You know, yes. again, we we talked about a lot of these things. They came with something at some point. Other than the armies that were all you know flat pack sprues, there was some method of carrying a lot of this stuff along the way. If you've built your own senior scenery, there's nothing unless yes. you made it along with the scenery. So some of the suggestions above are just as valid for terrain. 
Uh, one of our first suggestions, especially, put it out on display. Put it on your shelves. That, that's honestly what I do with most of my scenery. What I do is I mix it in with the miniatures. So the miniatures are out on the shelves, and I throw a tree and a building in the corner, and I'll put a hedgerow up, and all my orc arches are actually standing on a hill. Uh, that way it's there on display with everything else. Now, of course, the problems are the same here. The problems are just as bad with scenery as they are for miniatures, and that's, of course, running out of room and having to keep everything clean. And again, though, this is a sort of a combination of that display plus diorama and yeah. accessibility that's really handy if it wasn't a pain in the butt to keep clean. Yes, <laughs> and didn't take up so much room. Now, smaller pieces of scenery, you can use any of the miniature storage and transport recommendations above, right? So anything roughly man size should fit in a standard or miniature storage container. Tables, chairs, gravestones, fence sections, bushes, whatever. Uh, what you're not going to find, though, are your specialized traits. You're not going to be able to, I don't, I don't, I'm pretty sure, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe battle foam has a thing for holding trees, but I'm assuming they don't. I could be wrong. Uh, you're probably not going to find a, a specially made insert for your Hearst Arts made ruined walls on an AOL CD. It's just not going to be out there. Though, if you can design your scenery that's on a base, you may be able to use some of the inserts that hold miniatures by their bases. So I have seen this before, especially for objectives in games like Warhammer 40k, where you just make your objectives on a standard your miniature base, and if you have some form of transport that holds things by the base, it'll work just as well for your scenery or your terrain as it will for the original. So Battle, Battle Foam does have some uh, Warhammer Underworlds foam thing. Looks like uh, some scenery for, for, for specific games, but not... For a specific games. Yeah, yeah. So but otherwise, they'll sell... Not that you made your own. They'll, okay. sell you, they'll sell you foam, and you can cut it yourself, I'm sure. Which, of course, gets to um, uh, one of my next things, right? For larger scenery, you're going to have to look at cases for larger figures. And this goes back to the thing where I was mentioning earlier, where there's a lot of foam out there to hold tanks for Warhammer 40k, or the gargantuan units for War Machine and Hordes, the big stuff, there is thicker foam. And that might fit some of your scenery. Now, it's going to be a hit or miss, you're going to have to try to find something that works, but it might be able to work out. And you might even be able to sit there, and if you say you're going to design a forest, get the, the footprint for a land raider and use that as your base shape for your forest. Now, one thing you can get, and again, this is what I was talking about from uh, uh, Princess Auto, is the, flick, the pluck foam. Basic, right? yeah. you know, they're firm plastic cases. They come as toolboxes, and they come. This one actually already has it out, but it's got you know nice corrugated fo foam on top. And then there was a layer of pluck foam in here, and again, this would be great for your smaller stuff, your your fences, your your walls, and things like yep. that. And then. This is a small option. There are ones that are easily four times this size mm -hmm. where you can get into some of your larger landscape pieces and they have the much deeper pluck and pull foam. Yeah. So another thing is go to your hardware sorting tools. I, I couldn't think of a way to describe this well, but what I have is a number of Stanley, they're called small part organizers. So it's the kind of thing you put nuts, bolts, nails, screws, uh, whatever, your, your plumbing tools. Stanley organized, these are usually thicker. I have them for dungeon tiles, D&D dungeon tiles, but they can be great for scenery. What separates these above just your plano boxes or tackle boxes is they tend to have larger compartments and deeper trays that you can rearrange and put in different patterns to fit different things. And the other thing to look at is bins for storing nuts and bolts and nails. There's a, I don't, again, I don't know the, the technical term for them, but they stack together. And they're for you can reach in and pull out your nuts, bolts, screws, whatever. They small are. small parts organize parts organizers yeah, is like what it's going to be. Parts organizers, right? Yeah. And like honestly, if you're looking to store scenery, just go to your local hardware store and go through that section, and you'll probably see something that'll be perfect for what you're trying to hold. Really, it really is the best solution. If you've got anything you need to store, yeah. go to your hardware store, whether it's you know a Canadian Tire, a Lowe's, a Home Depot. Uh, whatever whatever it may be, Princess Auto is fantastic. If you've got something like that, uh, auto, auto parts stores, I really recommend taking a trip into one because auto parts have some really strange storage sizes that are required. And so they may really have something a little outside of what you're going to get in your normal store, yeah. in your normal hardware store, something more than just nuts and bolts because they've got to hold, you know, your brake clamp widget 
you know. Yeah. So sure. they're going to have those some of those other sizes. Um, but they're going to be there and there's and a lot of them are really cheap. Yep. All right, my last suggestion gets back to those battle boards, right? If you're going to make a battle board to display your army, you can do the same thing for your scenery. Make a scenic display board. Now, I got to admit, I've never seen one, but why not make a magnetic diorama of your terrain and scenery where you can just remove the pieces you need as you need them and then put them back when done. Like I, Someone must have done this, but every time I see it, someone's got their miniatures in there too. I'm like, I just want someone to like make a medieval city where you can take the bits out and then go play with them and then go put them back. I'm sure it can be done. Oh, absolutely. So uh, just again, looking at battlefoam.com, they have what they call magna racks. Which are a, uh, a metal carrying? Frame. It's well. It's actually it's a it's a metal racking sliding rack system of different depths and heights in a carrying case. So you've there got you go. basically it's a duffel bag that wraps around your metal sliding shelves for the magnetic uh, holding your magnetic stuff. And if there's no reason you can't put magnets in your scenery as well as your miniatures. So I hope that helps out, Jeff. That's at least some of my suggestions for scenery. Like I said, myself, mine's all on my shelves. But I know once you get to a certain point, that doesn't work anymore. Um, I, just at local game stores, I noticed what they often have is a specific shelf for scenery. Now, a lot of the scenery people use for the, for it uses foam core. So it's very light. It's pink insulating foam. And you'll see people just toss it on top of each other and stack it. But it always makes me sad. Because every game store I've ever been to, when I look through their scenery section, it's all dinged and beat up, and it drives me nuts. And I just, I feel bad for whoever made that for them. Because most game stores, either someone works there and made it, but a lot of them it's donated from from people who play at the stores, which is awesome. But I just look at these like, like didn't that take you a long time? Though so I don't know, maybe if I made 60 hills in one night, I wouldn't care as much. But all my pieces are always a little more detailed than what I usually see, so maybe that's it. All right, well, that's it for our thoughts on storing, sorting, and transporting tabletop game miniatures. We're going to head over to the lobby to see what the awesome folk gathered there have to say. So uh, we've had a whole lot of different stuff in there. Uh, well, I know Ryan, Ryan's been loving my, uh, my Princess Auto uh, comments. Uh, any <laughs> we, any we, Canadians we, who have been to Princess Auto know what I'm talking about. And I, I'm sure so there's an equivalent weird, in the States. Uh, I just, I, I, I don't know what it is. It's just a very odd store that has yeah. a strange amalgam of things in it. Uh, but for storage stuff, it's really hard to beat. The weirdest thing about Princess Auto is it's all off-brand. Yeah. It's like a <laughs> weird selection of stuff and it's not, I don't it's almost like, wish for car parts but not from china like well and like actually i have to say if you if you if you head into their uh, uh at least the, my the one i go to there's a back corner where they've got sort of toys and it's very much like wish uh yeah. including some very in in english uh oh, labels okay. on things uh my favorite was one i'd have to go back into facebook to find it but there was a box of and it was uh little lanterns where you put a little tea light inside and yep. send it flying away and reading the descriptions and the warnings on this box was just, it made my day. It was fantastic. Uh, other than that, uh, Ryan was asking about plastic bankers boxers, and I found a quick one at Walmart. So they do exist. Yep. Uh, you don't have to just deal with the, the cardboard bankers boxes, although that's the, the cheapest and easiest solution. Like, to be honest, like once you can buy the hard cases but like if you just have a hard case you can generally find foam in the right size i've seen people use laundry bins like i've seen everything personally Absolutely. i like the nice snap together with a handle on it but it yep. depends how much you're trying to transport too like some games take a lot of miniatures so if you're not playing at home yep part of the problem and we didn't really get into this too which i guess was actually part of the question so maybe we skipped over it was labeling everything right how if you've got all this stuff do you find Where's my orc army compared to my empire army, right? So that can also be an issue, which I, I didn't really have any solid suggestions for that. Yeah, I mean, print labels. Now, Ryan actually did mention in the chat room earlier, uh, there was someone who took pictures of the completed assembly of how the miniatures went away, yep. printed that out, Put stuck it, it well, and, and, and turned it into to, to labels that stuck underneath where the miniature goes. So you yep. can actually look and see, oh, this miniature, there's the picture of it. It goes right in there. So if you've got the ability to, to print that out and put it underneath 
yeah, uh, your storage cool. solution so that you can see what goes yeah, where. Yeah, got clear plastic. That makes perfect sense. If you yeah. got a clear insert, I've got one behind me actually for um Star Wars Rebellion. I've got yeah. that. There. That'd be a good one to have it. Or even if you're, or if you're doing Plano or something, and you can, you can put, yeah. you know, put the little. Uh... Yeah, I've seen that Plano where people take pictures and they cut it out and put it in the bottom of the, yep. the trays. I see a lot of people in the chat like uh, like Plano, Heartboard Games, uh, Ryan. There's some definite Plano fans in our group. Um, there is a ton. They're basically they're saying look online that that there is board game foam for pretty much everything. Like Battle Foam is the one that I I know of on my hand, but there is more. There there are tons of company doing them. Yeah, and Ryan was saying said something. He wants to DIY one of the super thick zipper binders into a minis carrier, and I have to say. That's probably actually not that bad an idea. You just need to make sure you find the right pull and pluck foam that's the same thickness as the binder. Uh, you know the the leather binder I use for my for for RPG. That would actually yeah, thin, aren't they? For most minis. Uh, well, not if you do lay down, stand up. Yes, oh, lay down. Yes. No. You could do you could do you know, an entire character set of you know for your RPG group or whatever in something like that, and it would be a, a nice easy carry. Uh, Labyrinth minis would all fit into one of yeah. those sort of thing too. Now, that's something else we didn't carry because he said hundreds of miniatures. But know what? There's a lot of out there now, especially on Etsy, are things that carry your dice and your miniature. There are a lot of that. But that's for carrying one your, your character, right? right. Your yeah, yeah, that's the RPG. Yeah. There are a lot of those out there. And some are really nice, right? It fits your set of dice, and it's a dice cup, and then it's got your miniature, which is really cool. Yeah, but yeah, that's not going to help you out if you're, if you're, no, you know, not if you're doing, doing the Warhammer army. army. <laughs> Yeah, hundreds of miniatures is definitely very different. So what I would love to know for any of you out there listening, hit me up, mo at tabletopbellhop.com, or go on, go uh, catch us on social media. What do you use? What do you do to store your miniatures? Is there something we haven't mentioned? Is there some method that we missed out on that we haven't tried? Now, I'll admit, I have not tried all the ones we mentioned tonight. Um, doing a quick search, I didn't see a lot of options that I hadn't already covered, so which I guess I kind of know what I'm talking about or something. <laughs> it was pretty cool. The metal trays was uh, one that I, there are a lot of people with these slide in metal trays for transporting their miniatures in various like carrying cases. I even saw someone using uh Tiffins for uh, Indian food because they all stack, right? And they got a handle on the top and they were using that to move their army around. I'm like, ah, that's pretty cool, but that's pretty specific. And I have no idea where you would get Tiffin trays for that. Yeah. But yeah so let us know. Uh, hit us up social media, send me an email. That'd be kind of cool. It sounds like Magna Rack, uh, M-A-G-N-A Rack, is the sort of the battle tray uh, official so the term. Battle tray version. Yeah, so of that's their uh, that's that's their um, that's their brand name, I guess, is Magna Rack. Uh, and I see a lot of there's a lot of care, uh, you know, even even Canadian distributors and things carrying that product yep. for battle foam. Very so, fair. all right, well. That's it for our main topic tonight. Remember, you can find lots of gaming topics and advice like this over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on gaming advice at the top of the page. Up next, with the difficulty of getting the required player counts to try out new games, we step into the time machine and resurrect a classic review of the Star Trek deck building games originally released in 2012. All right, back in 2012, Bandai games released three different star trek deck building games all designed by alex bykov featuring art by jack l hung i originally reviewed the next generation next phase version of the game on my windsor gaming resource blog in 2013 after finding these games at a local warehouse for a sale price of five dollars canadian each and those had an msrp of 34.99 at launch yeah. Now, over on the blog, tabletopbellhop.com, I republished my original review, along with the original pictures and everything that I took back then. Sorry about the quality on those. And added a bit of commentary, cleaned it up a bit, but left pretty much all of the original comment content. Now, I don't want to read off the full review here on the show, but what I will do is summarize quickly before getting on to my thoughts about these games about seven years later. A lot of things have changed in the deck building genre in seven years. Yes. So there are three different Star Trek deck building games that were released. There's the original series featuring Kirk and crew, the next generation featuring Picard and team, and a next generation next phase version, next phase, sorry, that is also Picard's crew, but with a focus on the Borg. 
Now, each of these games are standalone games, but can be combined roughly to you and used as expansions for each other, but were definitely designed to be played standalone. Each game features a completely unique set of cards, four different scenarios that actually play quite differently from each other, and there are four different scenarios in each of the boxes. So with all of them, there's 12 different scenarios. Now, each of these scenarios features a bunch of competitive scenarios, some team-based scenarios, and one specific cooperative scenario. That's in the next phase edition only. Oh, was the co-op uh, still relatively rare for deck-building games back then? Uh, Magic the Gathering sort of pushed everything in a pretty competitive uh, card game direction. <sighs> to be honest, I don't know if there was another competitive or cooperative deck builder out at the time. Like Dominion definitely wasn't. Trains wasn't. I'm trying to think of what was out back then. Tonto Core isn't. I don't think there was. This might have been the first cooperative deck builder. I'd have to Google that to know for sure, though. I can't think of one. Now, basic deck building applies for these. All these Star Trek games use a rotating market. And what I mean by that is new cards are placed as cards are bought. It's not like Dominion where the market stays the same. It's not a static market. It changes. Um, in addition to this, now here's the thing that's not standard deck building, is you have a space deck. And on your turn, after doing your usual buy new cards from the market thing, you can explore space. You do that by flipping over the top card of the deck. Now, this deck has all kinds of ships to fight, events that affect all players, and missions you can go on. Now, the missions are all pulled right from Star Trek canon, all from very specific episodes. And they are generally beat by players having specific requirements in play at the time. So that'll be based on their flagship they have in play and their cards in hand at the time. Your goal is to, in most of the missions, is to complete, or sorry, most of the scenarios is to complete missions, which will give you points, and most scenarios are raised to a set number of points. Well, nothing especially innovative there. Now, back when I first reviewed this game, I had only played the Next Generation Next Phase Edition on the original review. And while I enjoyed the standard game well enough, uh, in particular, it's called the Explore 2 mission, I, it was okay. What I really liked was the cooperative scenario. That's where the players are trying to take out the board before you get a simulator. Now, I enjoyed that game enough that I went out and picked up the other two versions of the game. Now, even if I hadn't read ahead, I expect this is the point where we introduce the problem after <laughs> you spent money on more bits. Yeah, thankfully it wasn't my money. It was only five bucks a box, right? So after trying all of the different versions of the games, there was a definite problem where if a player was able to get a better flagship earlier in the game, which is something you could do during that exploration deck, if you found an opponent's ship, you could destroy it, but you could also diplomacy it. And if you diplomacy the other ship, it becomes your new capital ship, and all of the cat ships in the deck are better than your starting Enterprise or whatever the, your starting ship is, which oddly were all the same Enterprise, but whatever. Um, what would happen is whoever got that ship first tended to steamroll. They, they just snowballed and because now they had a better ship so they could compete harder missions and then they can use that better ship to get even better ships and all the other players tend to get left behind. Interestingly, this wasn't a problem in the original series version. That had different rules for flagship rules where you didn't swap up your ship as often. And this obviously didn't matter in the cooperative version. It was actually good for the whole team if someone ends up with a better ship. But all other versions of it, though, it didn't really work. And this is a tough problem to evict once it's been introduced into any game. So due to this runaway leader problem, I actually don't ever recommend, don't pick up the next generation version of the game. Just the standard, the next generation's got a blue cover with Picard on it. Just get that. There's, there's no reason to pick that up nowadays. I also don't recommend playing the next phase edition, which is the other next generation version, with the exploration rules, the standard rules. So that leaves us with the original series edition. And I got to say, it's okay. Uh, it's, it's a decent game. It's a, it's a pretty solid deck builder. It, it's, but it's just nothing special compared to what's out nowadays. But if you're an original series fan and you're a huge Trek fan and you want to play with Kirk and crew, it's a solid enough game. You know, I, we had fun with it. But lucky for Lee for Bandai, there are lots of original series fans out there. Yes, there are. Now... Overall, I will stand by what I said in the original review in 2012, and that is the best way to play Star Trek the deck building game is to pick up the next generation, next phase edition green box with the board queen on the cover and stick to the cooperative rules only. Now, even with that said, even with that caveat, I have now sold off all three copies of the game. I did hold on to next phase the longest because it was the best of the series, but I let that go too. 
because all of these games just feel dated. They're just overall less fun than more modern deck builders. Like, while I dig the Star Trek theme, I'd rather play Tyrants of the Underdark as, as instead as a competitive deck builder. And if I want that cooperative experience, I'll break out like Legendary Encounters Aliens as, as a cooperative deck builder that I'd rather play. Yeah, and I mean, you know, if you're a fan, if you don't, if you don't want the Legendary, there's always the, uh, the DC uh, and uh, similar series, whatever they call their, their system um, out there as well. There's a lot of things out there. If you, if you check out Board Game Geek, you're looking at uh, mid to low sixes for yeah. these games. It's, and it's surprise. very obvious that the the start the next generation not next phase next just plain next generation is the weakest of all of them yeah. even even by rankings which doesn't surprise me at all like that that's just our personal experience having tried them all now what i would love to see though is these to come back i would love to see an update to these classic deck building games something more bon modern better balanced runaway leader problem fixed like i really liked the combination of normal deck building with that extra deck with that space exploration it just it wasn't balanced it didn't quite work i just need someone to develop the game a bit more play test it more i don't know what it needed something to fix it but i would love to see it redone because that one aspect made it feel more like star trek right that whole you explore strange new galaxies and seek out new worlds so you're you did that with that one deck it just could have been done better these were neat games for the time but I, I just, I want an update. I want to see a modern version of these games. If you are really into Star Trek and you want to check these out, I do recommend the, the next phase version of all of them to check out. Second would be the original series version. But overall, though, I think these games belong back in 2012. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think with the runaway leader problem, you're going to run into issues because, I mean, Trek fans especially know which ship is better and if the game doesn't represent that correctly you run into a whole other kind of problem by angering knowledgeable trekkies well for a more in-depth look at the star trek deck building game series of card games you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews and now the bellhops tabletop where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year what games hit our tables all right, so first game I want to talk about was actually a two-player game of Lanterns that Deanna and I played uh, during our after show last week after recording the podcast. Uh, this was part of Renegade Studios, Renegade Game Studios uh, Worldwide Play Day. If you didn't catch it live and you're not part of our Patreon, you're likely out of luck as the after show recordings only go out to patrons. Yeah, I still wonder how that's going to work out for patrons who only get the audio-only version of that. I know we talked a lot. We had stuff going back and forth. You were talking. It'd be interesting to listen to. I've got a copy of the audio. I should just sit and listen to it. <laughs> I gotta say, we did have fun playing that game. Um, did take a bit to get the card table set up and everything. I was surprised how well it worked for streaming, actually, the card table in the room. So that's something we may do again in the future it, it, instead of playing downstairs. But as for Lanterns, I've always loved this game. I've been a big fan of the game since the first time I played it. Uh, Deanna noted that it was better than she remembered, which is always a good thing when we finish playing. I was surprised how well it played with two players. So I got to say, what I like most about that game is the mechanic that when you play a tile, not only do you get something, but all the other players get something. So that has more of an effect with four players than two, but it still worked with two. And what's cool about that is the whole strategy of the game is I want to get something for me without helping everyone else too much, which I think is really neat. Sharing is caring, but if you do it right, it's evil caring, and that's <laughs> how you win. Yeah, even better is when there's out of lanterns and someone doesn't get anything. That feels so rewarding when playing that game. So up next came Friday night. Uh, this was another kid-free night with Deanna and I filled with charcuterie and craft beer, and that, of course, started off with more Unlabeled, the blind beer tasting game. Uh, at this point, we got a pretty solid group set of house rules we've been playing with that has is definitely making the game much more than it was out of the box now our next step to improve the game is we are going to print out an ibu rating scale and add that to the game so people can can bet on the bitterness of the beers as well because that is something that's sadly lacking from the original game the other problem though is every time we play this now we find at least one beer that just isn't on the list like like there's that style is not listed uh, black lager was one. And I like, I have two black lagers in my basement right now. How do you not have black lagers on the list? Well, I seem to recall you saying something about preferring to trust the designer publisher and everyone back in episode 82 on house ruling. 
<laughs> uh, fair enough. I did know <laughs> that I prefer not the host role. The thing is that I stress then, and I still believe this, is try the game. Play the game with the rules as written. Trust the designer. Trust the publisher. Know what they're doing. Play with the full rules. Learn it. And only once you've mastered the game, once you know you played ro- properly, then consider changing the game. That that was my main point back then. I did also suggest that if the game has to be fixed that much, you might be better off playing another game. But at this point, I haven't seen another beer rating game yet, though I am still considering making my own. All right. All right. The rest of that night was spent playing many games of eminent domain. Uh, first with just Exotica, and then finally combining Exotica and Escalation. Uh, so far, we both continue to enjoy using the scenarios. Uh, those are the things that made the game asymmetric, though we did find during this gameplay that they don't seem to be too well balanced with each other. Some seem to let players start off with some technologies that seem to be way better than what the other ones started off with. So I'm starting to think that if you want to balance, like if you want to... Uh, a chess-like experience, right? Like if you you want a you want a gathering of equals to see who's the better player, you might need to leave the scenarios in the box. It's interesting though. I wonder if with higher player counts, uh, you might not into run into uh, while A beats B, C beats A, and and you run into that if there's more of the scenarios out. Uh, that's definitely possible. That could be a thing. Uh, or even if you had three players, two people could gang up on that person who seems to have the advantage. That right. could be part of it as well. So that is definitely something. Because that is one of the problems right now is we are playing all these games two players. Yeah, and two player, I don't think, is really the best way to enjoy them. No, I, I honestly think three is better. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we're stuck with two players right now. Yep. Until they put the expansions online somewhere. Overall, uh, Exotica impresses us. Uh, I've now tried some very successful strategies using both the asteroids and the aliens though i haven't yet to get to work doing both which kind of fits in a way i think it's designed to go one or the other um overall i am digging it i think i think exotica as a standalone expansion is a win at this point with the base game just using exotica with the base game works it improves on the base game does some cool stuff if only board game arena had the expansion very true then we'd all be we'd be able to play at three players now combining the two expansions wow that is a can of worms like like it's a let the cat out of the bag it's nuts because besides having the tech decks from both expansions which are both like as large as the number that are in the base game there's this pack of cards that is specifically only added when you combine the two expansions and it's a whole bunch of new world scenarios and techs that you use and like this is a deck like it i, I don't i didn't count it but it's like a 40 card deck of cards you add in on top of the cards from both expansions and it just it's too much like deanna and i just found it overwhelming like you already have a lot to think about in eminent domain but now you're looking at five different tech piles instead of three you got techs that can be bought with research now with escalation you have techs that can be bought with ships so you got really you got 10 different tech piles because you got different ways to buy everything you got all kinds of new icons and it's just wow like it's just too much to take in in one or two games well the game does reward mastery so it might be something you adapt to and it might be even better if it's you haven't been playing drinking games beforehand oh there wasn't a lot of drinking <laughs> going on before i don't i don't think that impacted our ability to play eminent <laughs> domain maybe a bit i don't know so by our third game uh we are starting to find some interesting combinations and things started to play smoother and it definitely was getting more enjoyable uh, once you get to this point, though, like like Eminent Domain at this point with all this in front of you is all about system mastery. Like it's, it's almost become a lifestyle game, right? It, it feels like playing competitive magic and having to know all the decks and all the combinations and knowing that if my opponent's using a Swamp Walk deck, I should counter it with this. Like, like that's all going on here. It's like, oh, if she's going to play Aliens, I need to counter it with this. And, and I don't know. I don't, I don't know if this is a good or a bad thing. It's a thing. Like it's definitely something. It's going to turn some groups off. I think there's a lot of groups out there who probably got to this point with Eminent Domain and put it back on the shelf. And we're like, oh, I'm done. I, I I don't want to spend the time or investment to get good at this. Like, I played it. It's neat. Did some neat stuff. Let's move on to another game. Then I think there's going to be other groups, though, that are just going to deep dive this. Like, they're going to love it. They're the ones that are going to take that tech tree and mount it on the wall in their game room so that they can go and look at the cards or something. Or they're going to have it on their phone. I don't know. I, I, it's definitely going to appeal to different groups. 
Now, the problem I mentioned earlier, though, like, I, this, we're pretty much at the point. I want to review this. I, like, I have final thoughts. But I'm stuck with only two players. So before I get my final verdict, I need to try Exotic and Escalation together with more than two people. Because at this point, I don't feel confident to say I recommend it or I don't. Maybe there's something I haven't seen without four players or without five players, which is the other thing Escalation does, or three players. Maybe there's something that would change. It would go longer or shorter. I don't know. So at this point, definite thumbs up for Exotica. As for combining it with Escalation, I don't know. It's up to you. How much How much brain space do you want to dedicate to play Eminent Domain? Well, our next game happened online, and that was a four-player game of Clans of Caledonia with Deanna, Mo, and I, along with one of our patrons, Evil John. Now, this was a learning game for Sean and John. I, I don't think that impacted it too much. I think everyone really enjoyed it. I was really happy to learn that everyone had learned to play beforehand, so I didn't have to teach, so that was a big bonus. Thank you for that, Sean. Uh, I played horrible. I don't know what I was doing. I, I, don't, I honestly don't know. There was no drinking that night, so I, uh, I don't have that excuse, but I, that is like the worst board game I have played in a long time. I did terrible. Now, Sean, who this was his first full play, May have saved second place, like and like I, you might have doubled my score. I, I was so far behind. Well, this was technically my first full game of Clans. So we had started a game previously on Board Game Arena. I had been completely winging it for that one. Yeah. Now this one, prior to our start, I spun up a great tutorial on YouTube to get my head in the right place and went to Gaming Rules Vids, who had gotten me on the right track for other games as well. And and I I posted on Twitter. I mean, if if I can't have uh, Mo teaching me there in person, which is going to be my first choice. I think Gaming Rule of Vids is, is really where I'm going to uh, check first for a lot of these games that learning online just isn't the best option. So, you know, go to a teacher, find that teacher and, uh, and, and do that before you jump in and find out your uh, way over your head in <laughs> the online version. Yeah, big thumbs up for Paul Grogan. He's got a great YouTube channel. does some really good work. He does a lot of actual play videos for companies. He's hired to do their videos as well as doing his own work. So my only complaint for playing clans on Board Game Arena so far, I, I technically there's two, is uh, the first is the glory track isn't there. And due to that, it's a little hard to see when you'll get bonus money for importing goods. Though after we finished the game, we did see how it's shown. It's just not shown well. And well, then my biggest complaint about every board game arena game, and that is no undo. Uh, I was literally cursing about the no undo. Deanna was cursing about it twice, um, about it as well. It's it's yet another game where you don't have to have completely finished your turn. Like, if you haven't finished, if you haven't done all the things, you should be able to back up. And I don't see why you can't. Like, you're not revealing any new information. You're not... There's, it's all open with information. Like, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to undo. And it's stuff like you put a meeple out and you miscalculate your math and then it wants you to get a discount off someone and you're like, well, wait, I don't have quite enough money. And then you can't, you can not buy the thing off the person, but you can't undo placing the meeple is, is basically where it kind of goes wrong. Or if you click on the wrong spot, like, which isn't easy to do, but it's not hard to do either. Like if you click on the wrong thing and I just, man, undo, but that's all I want. If I haven't finished my turn, like if I've yep. done all my turn once someone else is done, but if I'm partway through, like if I'm partway through doing an action and I realize I can't do it, let me undo that. Yeah, I wonder, uh, because Clans, uh, not Clans, because Yukata has the undo, or it has the uh, the finish turn button, yes. I wonder if they have if, if they have Clans of Caledonia where we could check and, and, and see. We could look there. Have to, uh, I think we've still, still got some options there. Not that I love playing on that uh, system, but if it, it might make that portion easier. Now, another problem for old folks like me is the screen display. While the game is represented beautifully, they made some layout choices I'm not sure if I agree with in order to fit it all in there. And now, while you can mouse over many things for a pop-up, you really have to mouse over things, as much of the player card information is unreadable without assistance. My final game for the week, because this week's going to take forever due to technical difficulties, uh, is Quad Heroes from Wonderment Games. They're right here in Canada. Now, quite a few months back, I hooked up with the designer. Uh, I hooked up the designer with the fine folk at uh, the CG Realm. And Ryan came down from Ottawa and did a demo night of his game, uh, which was really awesome. Went really well. We had a, not a huge crowd, but we had a decent crowd. I think he had 
two different two to four games going throughout the night, which is pretty cool. And at the time, he left me with a review copy, which I got to admit, I feel a little bad that it's taking so long to get to. Now, one of the reasons for this, though, is because that game intimidated the heck out of me. Because the copy Ryan gave me to review was one of his demo copies. And it was filled to the brim with bits and bobs and bags. Like, there were baggies everywhere. There was a baggie of tiles, another baggie of tiles, some with square tiles, some with cubes. About eight different bags with different cards, all with the same back. Some were sleeves, some weren't. There was a bag filled with sheep. Just looking at the box, I was like, whoa, okay, I don't even know where to start. Yeah, sometimes with games like this, the unboxing itself can help take the edge off the scare factor of yeah. games. When you don't get to slowly work through all the pieces and punching, it's harder not to feel overwhelmed. Yeah, and to be honest, I usually read the rules before I get that far, so I kind of know what everything is. This was just a pile of stuff. Like, it almost reminded me of the same feeling when I opened up that Robotech Tactics and just saw the sprues. Just this was the board game equivalent of that. I was just like, oh my. So last night, I bit the bullet. I, I grabbed the rules, and I gotta say, I feel silly. Like, those rules are like not so dang simple. It's not like a, a, a kid's game, but compared to what was in that box, like, like there was no reason to be intimidated. Yes, there are a ton of bits that come with this game, encounters, so many different little square counters and decks of cards and stuff, but the game itself is surprisingly simple. The thing is, the game is basically a toolbox. It's, it's a toolbox for playing as well as creating a certain style of game. And that's of two-dimensional, well, three-dimensional platformers, right? Like, like a video game. All those tiles and chits and tokens are there so you can make all kinds of different styles of games. So a game creation engine as a game? Basically, right? So the way Ryan describes it is he says it's a mashup of Zelda, Mario, and Super Smash Brothers. And you know what? It fits because there are a ton of different scenarios in it. I didn't count how many. Uh, there are a ton of different. There's a whole scenario book divided up into sections. There's solo scenarios. There's team-based scenarios, player versus player scenarios, and cooperative scenarios. And these include lots of video game-like things. There's races. There's capture the flag. There's a big melee battle. There's sheep herding. There's a rally race. Like, there's all kinds of different things that you can b build with this. And in addition to the scenarios in the box, there are more on their website. And Ryan is very much encouraging people to make their own scenarios, make their own things with it, which is pretty cool. So now at this point, Deanna and I sat down and we played. And what we did was the, the three scenario tutorial campaign. So three separate games that teach you how to play which is actually really brilliant the way it, it onboards you because all the games use the same basic mechanic and it's something completely unique. Like I, I have not seen this in another game, which I think is, is really impressive and it's a brilliant system. So you have your character and there's a ton. I think there's 11 different characters in the box. Uh, I think the retail version comes with it. Six. I'm, I personally have a Kickstarter version, which thank you, Ryan. Uh, your character is cube shaped, like, like a die six, right? And you're going to place it on the board, standing up. It's got feet. You have to put the feet at the bottom, and the, their head is up at the top. And the heads all have a cue on it, so it's easy to see. And the first thing you do every turn is you tumble your die. You tumble your character. So you're going to tumble it forward or back or left or right. And that's going to expose a new face on your cube. You then do the movement skill that's tied to that face. And every face has a different movement skill, which you set at the beginning of the game. So orientation of your meeple, for lack of a better term, yep. determines your movement ability exactly. or movement. Yep, that's exactly how it works. So in the first scenario, that's it. That's literally all they do. Is they, they There's five phases of the game, or four, fa yeah, four phases and an end turn phase. All you do is play the movement phase, just to teach you those basics, to get you used to rotating your cube. And there's a really brilliant thing Ryan did here that, that blows me away that more games should come with. Robo Rally should come with two of every miniature for this. Is you have your cube on the board and he gives you an extra cube. And all that's for is so you can rotate it in your hand. So you can look at the board and go, yeah, I turn this way and turn. I'm like, that is so brilliant just to have that extra piece. Because otherwise you're like staring there going, if I turn this way, what's going to happen? So I thought that was amazing. So that's it. The first, first game is get the first person to the checkpoint. Uh, you can play solo. It's get to the checkpoint in seven turns. You can play six players, whoever gets the checkpoint first, whatever you want to do. But all it does is move on the board. You're going to avoid or jump over walls, avoid pits, try to push your opponents in pits, stuff like that. So 
uh, a good way to introduce a new mechanic like that is just you know that that's what you do you you have yeah. a mechanic and that is the entire tutorial is yeah, that mechanic it's brilliant it's great onboarding here's the new thing i've done with board game components learn this so then the second scenario adds an exploration phase each turn you're going to collect cards those can be used to boost your abilities uh there's things like food which give you a one-time bonus runes which put out stuff on the board like you can put walls out and you can put teleporters and put out springs uh, you can collect pets uh, every each character is allowed to have one pet and you can get upgrades which give you new abilities the goal in scenario two which is interestingly continues from scenario one you literally just add another board and keep playing which i thought was cool too is to hit four checkpoints three new ones pretty much same thing as the original game with cards now the last scenario once someone's hit the four checkpoint now you reset you literally clear the board set it up somewhat different. You're still using the same two boards. You put some crystals out and you put basically a goal. And what this does is your goal now is to grab a crystal and get it in the hoop, basically. It made me think of basketball, but it could be any of those, like cap to the flag, whatever. You have to grab a crystal, get it in the scoring spot. But what this does is it adds in the full rules. So what this adds is at the end of every round of the game, so all the players have gone, you get to upgrade your character. At each level, you're gonna get a choice of two different upgrades some of which are unique to the character, which we didn't even notice. It took till upgrade three for the two characters we had to realize, hey, yours is different than mine. Because I was like, hey, what's this symbol mean? Well, I don't have that symbol. I'm like, oh, cool. It's a way to make me symmetric. Need enough. Um, when you get the upgrade, you're going to get two choices. And generally, you're going to either increase the number of cards you get to take every turn, or you're going to increase how far you move every turn. And you're going to choose between those. And then later on, you'll get some weird special abilities. Like I could start launching bombs that were very much like Mario, where the bomb would move so many squares every turn until it hits something. Then it would blow up and destroy all the walls. Um, very neat. Uh, this scenario put everything in there. Uh, it also added stealing, because now that you have the crystals, you get to use the stealing rules. It was pretty cool. Yeah, I, I really suspect that Ryan's got to be a video gamer, because yeah. that is very similar to the path I would expect a digital game tutorial to take introducing different mechanics as layers bit by bit until eventually you're just playing the full game and you've learned it all because slowly it slowly brought it all to, to the table now overall it is really well produced like like this is like premium quality like even the tiles they did the I think it's called uv coating where you can make things look shiny they like all the rivers are uv coated uh, the cubes and everything have an ink wash on them, so you can like you can see the detail on all of them. They're not painted; you could paint them. Uh, even the sheep that come in three different colors have the ink wash on them. The bombs are actual D4s. You roll the bombs to see what kind of die they are and how far they move. Like just really top-notch quality. But it's a lot of it. Like there are so many, but that's to be able to play all these different ways to play. So for anyone else who happens to pick up Quad Heroes or sees it or sees the back of the box. Don't be scared by the amount of tokens, cards, components. It's really not nearly as overwhelming as it looks like it is. All right, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right, so I had a couple packages show up today from publishers, so it's going to be time for more unboxings. So we're going to have to have an unboxing day because I'm going to have to open this stuff up. Uh, for those of you here live, I will be opening the packages up tonight during the after show. So I also have a mystery package that showed up on my door as well as packages from, I'm going to let it slip here, Daily Magic Games and Check Games Edition. So some interesting looking stuff there. Now, once those unboxings are done, I've got new games to play and to review. So... Along with that, um, I do have some stuff we opened a couple weeks ago. I finally sat down and read the rules for Alpha and Exchange. Those are two games from Bicycle Cards. And I'm hoping to at least get Alpha played next week. It sounds interesting. It's basically a whole bunch of prisoner's dilemmas played in a row, which we'll see. We're going to try it out with the kids. Uh, it does say ages 10 and up, so I may try it with both kids. Uh, Exchange is a very pure stock at market game, like surprisingly pure like it may be amazing as a stock market exchange game or be really boring and i can't tell which and i don't know if i'll be able to sell that one on to the kids so i'm hoping to at least get alpha played uh, i think we're going to try to get the alpha unboxing up on monday that way it'll tie in with hopefully us getting plays uh and then quad heroes um this is how simple this is i think my oldest is going to love it in particular my kids have a game called robot turtles which is a board game version of Turbo Graphics or a Turtle Graphics that Sean and I and Deanna grew up with. For people who don't know any better, it's a basic programming language where you're like, move forward through, turn right, move forward three, turn left. And you try to get gems. Well, Quad Heroes has a very similar feel. And we have a feeling that, that um, 
Big G is just going to kick our butts at it because she spends most of her days programming on Scratch nowadays. So, and she loved Robot Turtles. I think she, I think it'll blow it away. And I think a, a younger kid, I don't know if she'll get it or not, but the older I think is definitely going to like it. So, I want to play some more Quad Heroes and get some explore more of that game than just the basic scenario. So, lots going on. Like the, now, it's at the but we got stuff showed up. Look, I have work to do, <laughs> which is awesome because I was a little concerned that without Origins and without Gen Con and without cons, that I wasn't going to be able to replenish my workload. I guess is a way to put it, and that seems to be happening. So that's pretty awesome. All right. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Yuho Rutila, thank you. Colin Massey, thank you. Kator, Kat, and Tori, we miss you. It's been way too long. We should have never let Deanna retire. I think that, that caused everything. There's nothing to do with bats. It has to do with a rat retiring in Gloomhaven. That that was the root of all this. If, if you watch our live stream, the moment Deanna retires, everything went to garbage. All right, well, Duran Barnett, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. <clears throat> Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you like the content we're providing and would like to consider and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop through our New and improved Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Remember here to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers in YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and unboxings. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.